insects are widely touted as the food of the future for humans. But for many predators, it's the food of right now. This motley crew all has one thing in common. They're insect eaters. Its Latin name is Mantis religiosa. We know it as the praying mantis. Their front legs, their, their grasp legs, are, are bent like this. So it looks like they're sitting in a, a praying position, praying posture. It might look like it's deep in prayer, but this insect is no choir boy. It's one of the most bloodthirsty and devious predators on the planet. Praying mantises are carnivorous insects, and so they're eating all sorts of other insects that are flying around and found in the same habitat as the praying mantis. One thing that makes it an exceptional bug killer is its state-of-the-art vision. A praying mantis has two large eyes, and these eyes allow the praying mantis to see in stereo. So they have an excellent sense of depth perception, which is important because a praying mantis is an ambush predator. That incredible field of vision can detect movement more than 20 meters away. And in addition to that, their upper body parts are completely articulated so they can turn their neck and look around in 180 degrees, and they can turn their up, upper body that has all their legs attached to it as well. Um, so they can look around for their prey and scan their environment for a prey that's coming in without moving their body. Which means this guy literally has eyes in the back of his head. As an ambush predator, this praying mantis has learned the ultimate trick of deception, camouflage. This African mantis has adapted to blend into its environment, so it might go unnoticed by its prey. And the master of this art is the orchid mantis. This mantis has not only learned to conceal itself through camouflage, it has actually learned to use camouflage to imitate a food source to attract its prey. An adaptation known as aggressive mimicry. So when a prey item comes to a flower to pollinate the flower or to enjoy a nectar meal, it's often caught unawares by a praying mantis that's sitting in wait for a prey item to come by. To complete its magic trick, the orchid mantis has also developed a black spot on the back of its abdomen. It looks like a fly and it allows, it attracts small flies to land on the praying mantis as if it was a flower, which gives the bigger flies the confidence that this is a safe place to go. Once a prey gets close enough, this mantis is ready to reel in its catch. The praying mantis will assess the distance to the target and pre-compute a strike strategy, and then at the last second, pull the trigger. It attacks with its large raptorial forelimbs, an attack so lightning quick that it's barely perceptible with the naked eye. If you take a close look at the forelegs of the praying mantises, you'll see that they're very long. They can extend them far, and they are equipped with long bristles and, and hooks. And that's what they use to capture their prey. For the prey, escape is futile. 
The four legs of a praying mantis act like a pair of scissors, except it's a pair of scissors with a large number of spines that are, will prevent anything from getting out once it's been captured. If the meal is still moving, that's not a problem. They like it fresh. Praying mantises are very, very ferocious predators. They'll sit quietly until something comes nearby, until they have a prey that's big enough for their liking. And they'll grasp it, they'll clasp it in their front legs, and usually they don't bother to kill it. They'll start eating it alive. If the prey struggles a lot, they might actually very strategically cut the prey's head off first to stop it from wriggling too much. Even at the nymph stage, some praying mantis like this one are all about deception and trickery. When the little praying mantises come out of the egg, when they're very tiny, they look like ants, and that's how they protect themselves, and that's called ant mimicry. It's a brilliant survival strategy for some, since most predators usually avoid eating ants. This nymph has a better chance than most to make it to adulthood. Deception starts early with this creature. As it grows into its skills as an ambush artist, it will transform into a supreme hunter. Its prey won't have a prayer. Is there anything not intimidating about scorpions? The stinger, the claws, just the way they move. But if these ruthless predators spook us, imagine how their prey feels. In our world, arthropods are literally everywhere. This enormous group, including all insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and more, make up an astonishing 90% of the animal kingdom. Whether they have six, eight, or a hundred legs, many evolve to survive in some of the harshest conditions. And the scorpion is one of them. Scorpions first appeared on the planet more than 400 million years ago. It's a hard place to survive, and it's a hard place to thrive but scorpions do both well. Being skilled hunters doesn't hurt. They are well adapted, not only to living conditions, but also because of the uh, broad range of uh, prey that they get from rodents to lizards to snakes, so all these different things that they would eat, making them a, a good predator because they've got these good pincers to grab a hold of it, good way of subduing their prey. So overall, they're just a great predator. These predators have mastered the art of killing. Even though they are nearly blind. So they have up to six eyes, but they don't really use their vision as much as they do sensory, sensory hairs and uh, chemicals, air movement. They feel uh, vibrations. So using that in order to grab their prey or find their prey rather than uh, the actual eyesight itself. When they do sense a meal, Speed takes over. Scorpions are extremely agile. You'll often see them scurrying around at night over the uh, forest floors, over leaf litter, over rocks, over sand, and they'll just scurry across. The scorpion's first weapon of choice? Their pincers. These powerful claws are used to capture and handle their prey. So. Different types of scorpions use the pincers for different reasons. Some of the, the scorpions that you find have really large pincers, very, very strong pincers that they'll use them to uh, physically crush and hold their prey and, and use that to kill it. Other scorpions uh, have very, very small, almost rudimentary pincers with a very thick tail, which are using their pincers more to just grab a hold of the prey with and uh, not strong enough to physically crush it. Once they've snared their prey, the iconic stinger finishes the job. The tail injects a dangerous cocktail of toxins. So the venom from a scorpion is uh, used to kill or immobilize its prey. When it's injected, it acts as a, it's a neurotoxin, so it causes paralysis, helps to immobilize it. But not only that, it also helps to start to break the prey down from the inside. It liquefies the prey. So it's a digestive protein enzyme that helps to, uh, for the scorpion to actually be able to eat its prey. 
after the venom is injected and the prey is liquefied. The scorpion digs in. The chalicera of a scorpion is, uh, are the mouth parts. That's what they use to uh, take in the liquid or hold on to their prey. So they're independently movable, and that's to help bring the food into the mouth. They independently move from each other, left and right set, and they will, you'll see them kind of chewing, or looks like a chewing action where they're actually pulling the prey or the food into the mouth. Scorpions may strike fear into the hearts of humans, but among the 1,500 to 2,000 species of scorpion, fewer than two dozen are toxic enough to harm us. Feared predators, efficient killers, masters of survival. Ounce for ounce, scorpions are among the toughest insect-eating predators on the planet. At first glance, it looks like just another pretty plant. But make no mistake about it, the Venus flytrap is a cold-blooded killer. It's quiet, sly, and efficient. And when the dirty deed is done, it barely leaves a trace behind. But it's why it kills that makes it so unusual and clever. As we know, plants get most of their food from the air by taking in carbon dioxide and combining it with energy from the sun in a process known as photosynthesis. But what's also known is that plants need important nutrients that they get from the soil through their roots. And that's a problem for the Venus flytrap because it usually grows in bogs where the soil is extremely poor in key nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen. And when those nutrients are limiting or absent in the soil, they still need them, they have to get them from somewhere else. And one option is to get it for, by eating animals. For the Venus flytrap, that means insects and other small invertebrates, mostly ants, spiders, and flies. Lots of flies. which is good because they need to order in when they're hungry. Being sedentary, plants need to have means by which they can catch those animals. They can't chase them down. And so this, the common way is to set up traps. And since a trap works best with bait, the Venus flytrap has evolved some effective solutions. These traps are also colored brightly red, which may in fact be a mimicry where they are pretending to be something that's attractive to invertebrates, be it something that's a, looking like a flower or could maybe resemble something like a piece of rotting tissue that is so exciting and attractive to invertebrates such as beetles and flies. But color isn't everything. When it comes to drawing in its prey, the plant has another trick up its sleeve they have these nectar glands, or glands that secrete a sugary solution around the margins of the trap. And as we well know through systems involving insects such as pollination, insects are very attracted to nectar and flowers. Scientists, however, are still pondering on how the plant closes its trap without the benefit of nerves, muscles, or tendons. One possibility is what you would call a hairy situation. On the surface of the pads of this trap are little plant hairs known as trichomes. And these trichomes are very sensitive to touch and once they become stimulated, it sends an impulse down to the midline. And this is what causes the spring-loaded mechanism. An analogy might be like a jack-in-the-box. Some scientists believe that this process is driven by some type of fluid pressure that's activated by an actual electrical current that runs through each of its two leaves, or lobes. When those trichomes are stimulated, it sends a chemical message to that hinge, which will essentially cause a massive migration of ions and 
cytoplasmic based water. And the movement at a very, very rapid scale of this, uh, the ions in the water create uh, differences in inflation of the cells that are in that midline with respect to those that are not, causing that midline to collapse on itself and close the trap. Whatever the mechanism, it works. Once these hairs are triggered, it only takes a third of a second for the lobes to close. But not every visitor is doomed. There need to be at least three stimulated trichomes before the trap will close. And there's a very clever reason for this. And this makes sense evolutionarily speaking because it would prevent it from, uh, from false alarm closing. Essentially, uh, closing the trap without a prey inside would mean that that trap goes about 12 hours before it can open again, and that's time that it does not get to feed. And that would be a waste of energy. With a fly caught in the trap, the truly gruesome work begins. Once the Venus flytrap has effectively closed an insect into the trap, specialized glands will secrete digestive enzymes into the inside of the trap and slowly digest that prey over the course of several days. The entire digestive process can actually last as many as 12 days. And during that time, to make sure its prey stays maximum fresh, the plant's lobes manufacture an antiseptic juice that keeps the insect from decaying. In the world of a Venus flytrap, nothing goes to waste. Nutrients are just too precious. When all is said and done, this gritty survivor from the bog stays alive by shutting its trap. To us, dragonflies seem delicate and agile. But to mosquitoes, they are terrifying. Luckily for us, their favorite meal happens to be one of our worst nemeses. It is seen as magical and peaceful floating through gardens. But these delicate creatures are voracious hunters. They're kind of the picture of serenity. But little do you know, dragonflies are actually amazing predators. Predators is an understatement. These serene looking insects are built to kill. If you were a fly, they are weapons of destruction. The dragonfly flies like it's an F-18 fighter aircraft in supersonic mode. Most insects hunt their prey by chasing them. The dragonfly is no exception. It's like a fighter jet with a state-of-the-art tracking system. When the dragonfly sees a fly flying, it's computing not where the fly is, but rather where the fly is going to be once the dragonfly makes it there. So the dragonfly strategy for catching this flying fly is to rather compute an interception course rather than to track the prey item and catch up to the prey item. The dragonfly actually anticipates where the prey is gonna be and intercepts it en route. Their sophisticated tracking system is a product of their huge eyes. Dragonflies have some of the largest eyes of all of the insects in the world. The head of a dragonfly is almost entirely an eyeball. And those are superhero eyeballs. There are more facets in them than any other insect, which means more pixels and resolution. They also have a 360 degree view, which comes in handy when you're trying to defend your territory or track down dinner. Once their eyes have mapped a flight trajectory, dragonflies home in on their prey using their equally sophisticated wings. They have four wings designed like window panes. Each is connected to its own muscle, which allows the wings to beat at different speeds and even move independently. As far as insects that can fly go, dragonflies are really at the top of their game. 
These are insects that not only can fly fast, but are also exceptionally maneuverable. Arguably, the most maneuverable of all of the flying insects. Dragonflies not only can fly forwards, they can also fly backwards. And they can fly side to side as well, not just change direction and steer. A transmission like a race car helps them hunt mosquitoes and flies. But the special adaptations that make them supreme killers don't end there. Once an insect is caught, the dragonfly uses its legs like a shopping basket. When a dragonfly captures a fly, it's not just using its wings and its jaws to capture the fly, it's also using its legs. As the dragonfly approaches the fly, it approaches from below. It then uses its forelegs to snatch the fly from underneath out of the air, and that's why we call it a capture basket. After the dragonflies have captured their prey, they will usually perch somewhere and then they will chew on their prey. So they have really great mandibles and they'll just chew along. And thank goodness for us, they do chew so much, including annoying wasps. And their hearty appetites help control pesky mosquito populations. A single dragonfly could eat from 30 to 100 mosquitoes per day. Dragonflies are voracious predators. You constantly see them eating, foraging, and no one really knows how much they eat, but it's estimated they eat probably anywhere from 20 to 50% of their own body weight because they expend so much energy in flying, and so they need to constantly feed themselves. Everything about dragonflies seems ruthless. If their prey is too large, they can neutralize it by biting it in the face. They have no problem cannibalizing other smaller dragonflies. Their powerful serrated jaws mashing them into a pulp. While they may seem beautiful, delicate creatures to us, to the diminutive mosquito, they're terrifying. Every predator needs a specialty, and these tenacious insect eaters have a great one they evolved to hunt for a virtually unlimited food source in virtually flawless ways.